Hi, good evening, everyone. I'm McKenna. I'm the owner of Murder by the Book in Houston, Texas, and I'm very excited tonight to be hosting this event for the new uh, MWA anthology, Crime Hits Home. Uh, we are going to be joined by um, several fantastic authors this evening. We've got S.J. Roseanne, uh, Sarah Paretsky, Naomi Hirahara, and David Bart, and they will be in discussion about the anthology of which SJ is the editor. Um, as always, if you're interested in ordering books, I'm putting a link in the comments right now for more information about this book and all the authors speaking tonight, as well as um, links to some of their other books too. If you have any questions, don't be shy. Um, I will get questions from YouTube and Facebook imported into my screen, and we will do those in the uh, later half of this event. So. Again, um, the more questions you have, the more fun um, this will be. Let me go ahead and um, start introducing our guests. So let me get my, my introductions in front of me. Here we go. Um, I'm going to start with SJ Roseanne. Hi, SJ. How are you? I'm fine, thanks. So and good thank to you. see you. Thank you for having us. It's so good to see you, too. I haven't seen you for years. Like I was, I was just in New York for Thriller Fest, and yet I am, you know, managed to not see all the people I wanted to see. It's never enough time. So next time. Okay. All right. Um, so S.J. Roseanne is the author of Paper Sun and many other crime novels. She's won multiple awards for her fiction, including the Edgar, Seamus, Anthony, Nero, and McCavity, the Japanese Maltese Falcon and the Private Eye Writers of America Lifetime Achievement Award. SJ was born and raised in the Bronx and now lives in Lower Manhattan. And as I mentioned, you are the editor of this anthology and I assume we'll be leading this discussion tonight. Yes, excellent. Thank you. Um, okay, so next up we have uh, in no particular order here, Naomi Hirahara. How are you, Naomi? Very, very good. It's like 90 degrees here in Pasadena, California. <laughs> It is. Uh, it was 103, according to the car um, temperature on the oh. freeway headed home earlier today. So I sympathize. It is brutal and hot and pigtails to keep it out of the way. <laughs> it's so 65 I'm, here, yeah. guys. So what can I tell you? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Um, okay. Naomi Hirohara is the Edgar Award winning author of the Masarai Mystery Series including Summer of the Big Bocce, which was a Publishers Weekly Best Book of the Year and one of Chicago Tribune's 10 Best Mysteries and Thrillers. She's also the author of the LA-based Ellie Rush Mysteries. A former editor of the Rafu Shimpo newspaper, she's co-written nonfiction books like Life After Manzanar and the award-winning Terminal Island, Lost Communities of Los Angeles Harbor. The Stanford University alumna was born and raised in Altadena, California. She now resides in the adjacent town of Pasadena. Thank you again for being here tonight. Thank you for having us. Uh, of course, my pleasure. All right, next up is Sarah Paretsky. Hi, Sarah, how are you? Hey, McKenna. So I'm it's so it's, jealous uh, of your glasses. In Chicago. It's how much, what's the temperature? 60. Ah, uh, I'm jealous of that too. Yeah. <laughs> Between your glasses and the temperature, I feel like you're <laughs> winning the evening already. <laughs> All right, so um, Sarah Paretsky is the New York Times bestselling author of 23 novels, including the renowned V.I. Warshawski series. She's one of only four living writers to have received both the Grand Master Award from the Mystery Writers of America and the Cartier Diamond Dagger from the Crime Writers Association of Great Britain. And she lives in Chicago, where it is beautiful weather right now. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, thank you for being here tonight. And I will mention that um, we didn't host you for your latest book, but you do have a recent um, release and maybe we'll hear a little bit about it and um, uh, later on. Thanks, so, Megan. Of course. And last but not least, we have David Bart. Hi, David. How are you this evening? Fine. How are you? I'm well, thank you. Um, what's the weather there? <laughs> hot. Hot. Okay. Um, David Bart is a longtime contributor to Alfred Hitchcock Mystery Magazine has published in Ellery Queen Mystery Magazine and has had stories published in four Mystery Writers of America anthologies, among many others. He lives in the East Mountains of New Mexico with his wife, Linda, and temperamental rescue cat, Ripley. He loves Cabernet wine of the box type, chocolate of the dark variety, and Mexican food as hot as is allowed by law. He hikes, kayaks, and travels when not writing. And um, as all of these people do tonight, you have a story in um, Crime Hits Home. So I can't wait to hear about that. Um, we've got questions and comments coming in. I'm going to let you guys talk. Have a wonderful time. Um, if you need anything, I'll be right here. Just call me on when you're ready to do questions. Thanks again for being here. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, 
Uh, first of all, for the audience, this is the book. Can't wait to see it. Yeah, yeah. The um, these the uh, the audience needs to know that the writers have not seen the book yet. Only I have. Um, there was a series of of glitches, none of which I was responsible for, in a very odd, um, you know, confluence of of events. Because I usually am responsible. <laughs> but um, the writers' books are, are are being sent out, so they haven't read each other's stories, which is an interesting situation. Um, uh, but I'm gonna I'm gonna dive right in. The first question, um, well, yeah, okay. I'm gonna start with a question. And the first question is, when you got the request to write a story uh, for a book entitled Crime Hits Home, and the way I, I phrased it, I think, is that home can be anything that you define it as. Um, what was your first thought Aside from oh my god, really? Um, what would you know? What 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 did you think? Uh, and and did that thought end up being uh, what you really wrote in your final story? Um, David, I want to start with you um, because, <laughs> for one thing, your story is um, called the the uh, oldest living detective, the world's oldest living detective, and and so you know. <laughs> I'm, I'm wondering. It's clearly not autobiographical. So, uh, but is that, is, was that that story and that setting? Is that what came to you first? Yes. Uh, the I wanted to do something with the home aspect that was different <clears throat> that I thought maybe wouldn't be in there with the other writers, and that was um, the retirement community that he's in, the Ethan Brock. So the idea of a retirement community was your first, it, it, that's as you yeah, about it. I thought that that'd be kind of interesting, yeah, to, to go into a situation like that. Yeah. Okay. And Sarah, yours is, is a more spiritual home, a more... Um, well, there's also a, a specific physical home. I think when I was first imagining writing a story for the anthology, and thinking about my experience of home, it's so amorphous. And um, some of my childhood home and those experiences I've already written about in different guises in, in my novels. It's something that I've been thinking about a lot outside of this, this crime novel. I've lived in the same house now in Chicago for over 40 years. It's a big house, big for one person. And I'm thinking, should I leave? But it's home in a way that none of the places I lived as a child felt like a grounding, nurturing place. Mm -hmm. So the home that I created was partly a community, but my story is called Little House in the Big Woods because it's a young woman who, like me, her physical home is not a nurturing, welcoming environment. The relationship with her divorced father is, is fraught at best. And she finds and actually restores this little log cabin that's adjacent to a retreat center, a religious group that she briefly gets involved with as a, as a late adolescent. But for her, that cabin is the place that she really feels she can call home. And so I was trying to think of what, what would a space be that would feel like my special space, which I think is my idealized version of what home means. Interesting. Yeah. And now Naomi, your story, uh, in addition to being the darkest thing I've ever seen from you, um, <laughs> is um, a story of a home that your protagonist doesn't love as a home, but it is home. Um, how did that happen? How did that come to you? Uh, well, I'll answer that in a second, but I, I want to throw out a question to you that you could maybe answer after I <laughs> answer. <laughs> but um, because I was thinking when you first post this concept, I thought you were going to get a lot of pandemic stories. I thought you were going to get a lot of things, you know, very reflective of what we were going through. And I don't think that necessarily happened. But yeah, I, I so my question to you is, what, what were you, uh, how were you surprised by, you know, what you received? 
Um, for me, you know, when I get these requests, a lot of times there's a story in the back of my mind that I want to explore, but I just haven't had the chance to. And I just love um, the short story form, right? Because you could always test something out. And, and I've done a lot of nonfiction work on um, like very, this very narrow field of like Japanese American history. And one of my areas of expertise, I guess, is like the Japanese style garden. And I write a lot about um, the people behind those gardens here, like in California and actually in, a, in New York, a lot of different parts of the world, uh, the nation. And um, the very famous um, Huntington Gardens, um, that uh, Japanese garden started in like a nickel, uh, uh, a place that you went in, quote, old Pasadena, you paid a nickel. This is at the turn of the 20th century. And you got to get, you know, serve some tea and just walk around a Japanese house and garden. And it turns out when I was writing about this real place that um, my one of my high school teachers, his grandfather had and grandmother had been the ones that were assigned care, to be caretakers of that garden. Mm -hmm. And they lived there. And, you know, and I think we as Americans, we romanticize that, that experience. But when I saw the old photos, like this young woman in a kimono in America, and she did not look happy, and she had two young boys. And these young boys wanted to be American, but they were kind of trapped in this Japanese world. And, you know, they were on one hand, that exotic world was... Um, celebrated, you know, by Americans. But on the other hand, if you're a young kid, your peers don't think it's that cool. And, and you know, that's probably how a lot of immigrant kids feel today, you know, in fact, about, quote, the home, their parents' home country. So I just, I thought that would be interesting to explore that as this exotic kind of location as being kind of a prison for this a young boy and kind of playing it out. No, so that, my question, yeah. <laughs> that really did come across, yeah. Okay, so your question to me, that then this, this, you know, we'll get to the pandemic. I want to have questions yeah, yeah. for you guys about the pandemic because when this book was conceived, it was um, early 2019. Uh, we had this topic and um, there was, you know, home was a good thing. <laughs> that is, home was a thing that you you might have had and might have not had but it as an idealized thing it was it was a good thing and um by the time people were writing their stories home was for a lot of people oppressive claustrophobic you never wanted to see it again <laughs> you were trapped there and um i expected some of that um to come out there really um what, what surprised me, Naomi, um, is that now I didn't see all the submitted stories. Okay. The judges saw them and, and, you know, made a, a pass through them. So there may have been uh, pandemic stories, but I didn't see any. The closest to that idea is um, the relentless flow of the Amazon where, um, you know, the Amazon is, is, Amazon.com and the boxes just keep coming. And that's what he means by that. Um, so I was surprised not to get those mm -hmm. stories. Um, and I think it's partly because at that point, none of us really knew how to write about that. You know, when you, mm -hmm. when you write about a disaster, it's usually over. You can, you know, the, the great war books don't come out to the end of the war and, and that kind of thing. And, um, even the 9-11 books, you know, 9-11 took place in a day. It took us months to get our heads around it, and then the books could start coming. But this was still going on. And I don't think anybody knew really what to do. The book I was writing at the time, um, I had people no longer shaking hands. It just wasn't something people did. Um, now everybody's shaking hands again. So... Um, you know, I was wrong about that prediction. 
So that was one thing that surprised me. Um, and another thing that surprised me, as long as I have the floor here, is um, that a lot of the stories were not dark. I expected a lot of serious mm. darkness. Yours, as I say, is the darkest. That's why I put it first in the book. I figured people, you know, once they read that, they don't have to be afraid of anything. Um, <laughs> um, uh, a lot of them did not end well, but a lot of them did. And that that interested mm. me. Um, so let's talk a little about the pandemic um, because last time I did uh, an event like this, uh, Jonathan Sandlofer asked, did anybody feel the pandemic affected their writing? Um, or were you able to move your head elsewhere? Now, of course, you know, none of us have a control for that. We don't know the story. We would have written it under different circumstances. But did you feel the pandemic affecting your writing? Sarah, can we start with you? The pandemic affected my writing indirectly in that I, I felt untethered, but there was so much, so many things producing anxiety. The former guy's presidency, which then devolved into the assault on the Capitol and the assault on the Constitution, which continues to leave me unraveled and off, off balance. So the pandemic was another thing. My husband had been dead for about a year, year and a half, and that was also something that was feeding into my feeling untethered and unraveled. It affected my writing in the sense that I, I couldn't seem to think coherently. And in a way, I, was, I, I had trouble overboard my new book, which just came out a couple, was published a couple of weeks ago. I often throw out, rewrite, throw out, rewrite, but I never have done what I did with overboard, which was to have a whole story with characters that then the characters weren't doing the story. And so I threw them out and started over again with new characters, new storyline. And I did that seven times before I finally thought I have to write this book. I'm already way late on my deadline. So in a way, writing the short story for the anthology, uh, because I was late getting to it and I had a very short window, very tight deadline to turn it around in. I, um, it, it forced me to be concentrated and, and think in a particular way. But also, although it's, it's in a way timeless, but it's specifically set during the Iran-Contra business with uh, part of the, the plot has to do with a woman who's got ties to the, the, con, uh, to the um, Sandinistas. But I can't even remember what side anyone was on anymore. Anyway, to that <laughs> civil war conflict. Um, and so it, it was, the pandemic was irrelevant to it. David, did you feel yourself um, one, one way or another affected by the pandemic as you wrote? Well, I think I used the, the right writing to escape it in a way, you know, because it, I just get into it. And that was kind of a reprieve and I liked that you know, quite a bit. I, I don't think it affected the story other than maybe I wanted to stay a little light uh, in ways, you know. Yeah, and, yours, uh, yeah right. because, you know, it, it gets old, <laughs> that whole thing. So I just wanted to write something that, even though it had dark aspects, it was lighter. And I enjoyed that. Yeah, yeah, yours was one of the ones that, um, that did, you know, end up kind of uplifting. I just wanted to say, I, I have mentioned the relentless flow of the Amazon. That was by Jonathan Stone. Um, I don't want to not give the author. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so Naomi, yours, um, in addition to being dark, did feel claustrophobic. Is that um, a result of your subject matter or do you feel like the uh, the uh, pandemic had anything to do with that? Or Yeah, I, re I do think the pandemic did affect my writing. I mean, I was working on uh, Clark and Division, um, which was my historic uh, mystery set in Chicago, and I've spoken to Sarah about it. Um, and that was set, um, the, that storyline is about the early release of Japanese Americans from World War II detention camps to Chicago. 
and that's that was very much like what we were experienced like we were in confinement they were in confinement we we were in confinement and suddenly things were loosening and we were going out in the world but it's like what kind of world is this mm -hmm. you know so um i was able to channel a lot of my um i don't know paranoias fears <laughs> all that all those things into that book um and and in terms of um grand garden my short story and your anthology during the pandemic the thing that saved me was actually gardens right mm -hmm. because i lived here in beautiful southern california and actually huntington is like a stone's throw away from me there's a lot of so that was my escape but i was kind of thinking what's the dark side to this wonderful beautiful place so you know, I think as mystery writers, we often, you know, go to that dark side. So I thought it might be fun to kind of fun to look fun. at that. Yeah. And, and, and certainly I do think, I mean, Avidia Yu, I know she wrote about um, anti-Asian violence and um, I'm that was, sure. Hmm? Avidia's story was also surprising to me because um, I don't expect that kind of darkness from her. Um, although lately her books have been getting darker, but um, that that also, um, I, did, have you read it, Naomi, her story? Have yeah, you? I did read it because we did get the PDF. I, I just didn't have, it's just hard sometimes to read well, PDFs. PDF pain. <laughs> but yeah. I was curious because you had mentioned that, you know, her, her short story was very dark. So I go, oh, I got to read it. And, you know, maybe there's something in our subconscious. I mean, I don't know, you know, she's over in Singapore, you know, I'm here in America, but um, yeah, just like what was happening to Asian Americans in this country during the pandemic. I mean, maybe, yeah, no, certainly that's something that has made me more mm -hmm. committed to kind of writing this, these historicals mm -hmm. um, kind of, you know, with the younger generation not knowing um, certain thing, you know, discrimination and, and tri trials and tribulations that their elders had gone through, you know, I, and, and since I love history, I go, well, this is maybe a good and purposeful mm -hmm. thing to be doing at this time. Yeah. I was an early reader of Clark and Division and the, the setting in the, in the camp is, is so powerful and really, um, uh, very emotionally, it, it's uh, written in an in an unemotional way in the in the Chicago architectural school mantra of less is more, and really makes you feel and, and experience it in a powerful way. That's um, that's that's Clark and Division, ladies and gentlemen. Um, you can get that at uh, at Murder by the Book. It's it's paperback at the end of June, so pre-order it from Murder by the Book. Well, there you go. <laughs> Um, I was working on Overboard and the pandemic was waxing, waning, waxing, waning, and I wasn't sure how to include it since my VI novels are always set in contemporary events. I had it part of the context, so people were wearing masks or not wearing masks to show their contempt for those around them. And that, that has led me to receiving some unusual hate mail mm -hmm. from anti-maskers who tell me that they will never read another book of mine because mm. of my left wing agenda. And I was like, left wing agenda, wearing a mask is now the left wing agenda. Well, and and if they haven't picked up on your left wing agenda yet, <laughs> right. um, yeah. every time I get one of these letters, I go, God, I thought my audience had already selected itself out. But <laughs> right, right. <laughs> um, I, my, my answer to, to that same, to the pandemic question, was because I set my story in um, in the in the 50s. I said, well, late 40s, right after World War II, and it's um, among uh, refugee children who came from concentration camps to be adopted in the U.S. And my sense, and it wasn't so much the pandemic, although it was that, but it was the anti-maskers and the the politics of the time, and it was all of this. And I wrote about a child, she's really 15 or 13 or something, I forget even now, who basically says, no, that's enough. That's it. I'm not 
going to give into this. I'm not going to put up with any more of this. I've had it. I've been through enough. I'm done. And this is my stand. And I think, you know, I, it was kind of a, a fantasy um, that that you could take a stand at that point. You know, politically, you can. Against a virus, you really can't. There's no stand to take, you know. Yeah, that's part of it. It's so stressful. Yeah, you, you, get your, you get your vaccines finally and you wear your mask and that, you know, <laughs> there is no stand. And I think I, I really wanted a, an enemy you could see that you could say, no, I'm I'm meeting you here, and that's that's it. Um, do you? Um, uh, pretty soon we're gonna have to break for questions. But do any of you feel like um, there is another story? If we did this book again, which we won't, but if we did, <laughs> is there another story you would like to use the same theme um, and 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 present. Um, anybody? Anybody? Well, home is endlessly. Is is there are just endless numbers of things that you can say and write about being home and slice and dice in a lot of different ways. You know, one of the things I've been thinking about lately is, you know, for the hyper wealthy who have multiple homes, if that's mm. Do you ever really feel at home anywhere or are you just always in transit? That's that's a really interesting question. And especially if each of your homes has been um, worked on by uh, some fancy interior designer and whatever. So it's not even your stuff. Right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that's that's a really interesting question. And where would you call home? Well, maybe we will do another volume and we'll work on it. Lydia Blatt, who has one of the most, um, I don't know, terrifying imaginations of anyone <laughs> that I read. She did a, a one of a short story collection, one of these sort of chain short stories with someone who's a stager um, in uh, homes and, and what that woman does when um, getting revenge on on a man who's she's been trying to sell an expensive home to who's who's done her wrong. So I think there are just many different ways that you could look at this. SJ, did anyone write about home restoration or home renovation? Uh, no, no that, that's <laughs> interesting. With the, yeah, there are. Um, I expected a skeleton in the wall story. Yeah. A, uh, um, but but that that didn't happen. Which I I I, I found interesting. Um, there, the the definitions of home in the book are really very very mm -hmm. very, and that was was kind of um, thrilling to me that some people actually it's the family home and you go back there, but for other people, it really was um, a, a a kind of place of community. Um, uh, uh, Renee James wrote about her community, not her physical home, although that comes into it because there's a threat to her home, but really it's her people. Um, so I, I thought that that was interesting. Um, Walter Mosley has a, it's a long rambling story um, before it, it gets to a home. And, uh, you know, it's, it, the it, people's approaches were really, really uh, interesting to me. Um, so um, I, one of one of the uh, one of the interesting uh, questions that came up um, in another talk, which has actually nothing so much to do with with this book as it does with your lives, is um, what are you reading now, and has that changed? I know during the during the pandemic there were people who just couldn't read anything that wasn't like by like P. G. Wodehouse or something. You know, I mean, it just it had to be light and funny um what are you reading each of you now and and uh and is it something you would recommend and is it something that mckenna sells at murder by the book well during the pandemic i just uh, quote discovered you know she's a best-selling author and um but ellie griffiths yeah i love ellie griffiths work well i love her her um ruth ruth galloway series more than yeah. the 
Brighton magicians don't speak to me quite so much, but yeah. I, I did, um, I mean, I, I probably shouldn't say that I was listening to audio books because we do want to sell books, <laughs> print books too. But, um, but uh, yeah, so I was listening a lot, you know, when I was doing my household chores in the house. And I think, you know, with Ellie Griffiths, because she's written so many books and um, it's all about character, you know, and some of it is very repetitive, actually. But it was a good thing because my mind could only, you know, my, it, it was like a sieve. So I needed like little reminders, like who who was with who and all that. But yeah, I'm a, I, yeah, so that's, I'm not reading her currently. I'm trying to, I have to blurb some books. So I have a lot of homework right now, but right. that was one author that um, I picked up. It was, it was comforting for sure. So, so you were you were going for for comfort during that, yeah, yeah, yeah. and just relationship with characters mm -hmm. and the characters that would reappear, yeah. David, what what are you reading and what were you reading? Uh, well, I I just uh, finished for the second time the art of violence. So. <laughs> Some upcoming. I know, writer. I know that writer, right? Uh, um, which I read a book through for entertainment and if I like it, I read it a second time and try to learn. Mm -hmm. I do with about everything. Yeah. I do. I read Overboard by Sarah and uh, yeah, An Eternal Lay by Naomi. So that's recent. Um, prior to that I read uh, John Sanford had a has a book out about his daughter as an investigator. I don't know if you've read his work, but he had a, a daughter, Letty, in some of the books. And uh, it's, it's pretty good. It's entertaining. Yeah. So your reading didn't change through through these years, through the pandemic years. You, you focused on the same things you had. Uh... Yeah. I, I'll have books around and I read a little bit, you know, a one or two. And I like to go back. I read... Uh, some short stories that I liked uh, from the past. Yeah. So that's and Sarah, right. what, what have you been reading? And uh... what I've been reading lately you know, during the pandemic, um, I, I just found it, or during the height of it, the lockdown and the all of that, I, uh, I found it hard to concentrate. And so I, I was rereading more than I was reading, but. Um, I read some really good books recently. One is The Dictionary of Lost Words. And I, I'm not often fond of historical fiction because it tends to be overdetermined, which is frustrating. And also it's really hard to get the language and the nuance and so on right. But this book is spot on. It's set in the making of the Oxford English Dictionary, told through the eyes of a fictitious young woman who starts capturing the words that the dictionary omits because they're the street language of women who are illiterate. Mm. Therefore, their words aren't in the documents mm. the dictionary is capturing. But it's just a beautiful, beautiful book. Uh, crime fiction, I just read a uh, writer new to me, newish in our genre, Tracy Clark, a uh, really mm. good writer. Her third novel is what I started with, Runner. She understands Oh, just the streets, the police, the private eyes, and she writes like an angel. Like a, she's like, a um, she's a prosecutor, isn't she? I, I think oh, she's a private eye. Oh, she's a private eye. Okay, she um, yeah, right. She she um, runner, and there's a, a second one or a third one that you're reading. Runner is the third, and then because the uh, because just the way that we're thinking and talking about race has made me much more aware both of what I don't know, but also the the history that I don't know. I've been playing catch up with that. I grew up in Eastern Kansas, which was has always prided itself on, you know, the home of abolitionism and bleeding Kansas and coming, bringing Kansas free into the nation. But digging into that history has been quite an eye opener. So I've been reading books about um, 
you know, hard to take books, but things that I think I really have to face up to on um, the amount of lynchings in Kansas, well, throughout the Midwest, really throughout the country. Um, but then a book that was very inspiring for me, um, The Agitators, if I can quickly find it. Yeah. Um, so um, The Agitators is, I can't see it. I don't know how to work with the screen. Um, it's a, a sort of a bio history of, of three abolitionists, Harriet Tubman and two white women who were so committed to her, to her work that they um, helped bankroll a lot of her work, got her a house in upstate New York. Uh, and just the friendship among mm. these women and the fact that the anti-slavery movement, uh, the women's anti-slavery societies often were had mixed race membership and and the white women were content to have black women leadership. And I think where did how did how did we move away from that? Right, yeah. Comfortable yeah. as white women with black leaders to um, to where we are now. So a lot of very thought provoking reading and hopefully although I sometimes think my brain is like a bowl of rice pudding with a few raisins that occasionally <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, um, McKenna, do you have uh, anything for us? I do. How are you? That was great. Um, so I have one, I have a couple things that are particular to authors and then a couple of broad questions. Um, one is um, Kathleen loved Naomi Hirahara's Clark and Division. Any more standalones coming? I have a follow-up to actually Clark and Division. So I guess it's not really a standalone. Who knew? It's called Evergreen. And I'm finishing it up right now. It's going to be set in Los Angeles in 1946. Which means Clark and Division isn't a standalone anymore either. Uh, that's what I'm saying. That's what, that's, I know. That's, and uh, so it'll be coming out in August of next year. Hope. Okay. Um, Okay, so a question for everyone. Um, how do you choose when to serve the characters and when to serve the story? Um, I'm assuming this is a plot versus character question. Um, I'll just go in the order of which y'all are on my screen. So I'm gonna start with SJ. I always serve the characters. I, I try to bring the characters into a story Sarah was talking about this earlier. It was interesting, but I try to bring the characters into a story they want to be in. That that I try to bring them into their story. Um, but once they decide they want to go that way, I will go that way with them. Um, my assumption, after all these years, it used to make me really nervous to do this, but my assumption after all these years is that my subconscious from you know that's producing the characters and the story understands what it's doing in a way that my conscious mind may not and so i i, I never try to persuade the characters to do what i want because the one time i tried to do that they, it absolutely didn't work and it almost blew the book up and i had to, to go back and that was a very early book and i've never done it since it is nerve-wracking but um when I was a mere pup, I heard Sarah Paretsky on a panel. I don't know if I ever told you this, Sarah. Um, and um, you were saying that you don't outline and that, um, you know, you just, you know, you write the book as it goes. And one of the men on the panel said, oh, my God, Sarah, don't say that. You're, you're, you're a pro. You've written a number of books. But there's all these young people out in the audience and they're, they're you know, they're thinking that that's okay. And I'm thinking, shut up, Sarah Peretsky just said it was okay, um, and and so I was, you know, inspired to uh, to believe it was okay, and uh, you know, and and the truth is, half of half of writers do it that way, and the other half do the plot first. What can I say? But I I always let the characters do what it is they want to do. How about you, Naomi? 
You know, um, more recently, I, I'm kind of letting the concept go first, which is very different from me. And then determining who's the right character to carry out that concept. It was, it's slightly what you were saying, SJ, I think. Um, in terms of determining the character, you know, like once once you know which character you'd let him loose, you know, so so it's not um, strict outlining, but um, yeah, but for me, I think like for instance with Clark and Division, it was very important to have for the protagonist to have her own story, um, not only determined by historical events, but just the fact that she's the younger sister, you know, and the older sister was the one who um, met a tragic circumstance and would the younger sister come, you know, so, and yeah, so it, it this was a little different than my, like my Masarai mysteries where I knew it was this old curmudgeonly, you know, gardener. That was a character and we were just gonna follow whatever he did. So I, yeah, I'm changing a, a bit and um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of enjoying this um, little bit of a transition in the way I approach stories. Sarah? I almost always start with the idea of a crime because my books are set in um, looking at white collar crime, but I can't write until I have characters and a story. So you think of it as uh, two two layers where the, the crime is the underneath layer and the characters who are telling the story are what you really are caring about and concerned about. Once I have characters in motion, the, the things that I imagined that they could do, and I think this is really a different version of what SJ was saying. Once, once they're in motion and you start seeing how they act as, as people, there are things that, that they can't do or that they will do that, that alter the storyline. And, um, and so that's, that's basically how I write. A lot of times I've thrown out as much as 250 pages when I've written wow. myself into a, a corner. Uh, I know it's, it's horrible and it's why I write so slowly. I actually write very fast, but I think so slowly that it takes me almost two years to write a book. Um, David? With me, it's usually a spark, some line or an idea or something. And then I start from that. I start with the characters and build from that. Like I had a short story in Hitchcock, this has been a few years ago, uh, where the I had a line, Grandpa, you got to stop killing people. <laughs> and so I, <laughs> I went from that. And it all filled in, you know. And, and did that line just kind of pop <laughs> in your head one day? Yeah, I don't know where it came from. <laughs> my grandfather, I don't think, was a killer or something. That's, that's <laughs> you know, great. It jumped in my head. Line. So what story is, did that develop into a story that was, oh, you, you said it was in Hitchcock. Yeah. yeah. Well, what was the name of that story, David? Oh, Star Rock. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's a place in, well, in Illinois, it's in the southern part of Illinois, but I put it in another place. That's right. You're from the Quad Cities. I was wondering how you knew Star Rock, but of course you know it. Yeah. yeah. So. Um, okay. So we have a, another question. Um, this one's uh, oddly specific. So I think if anyone has a comment on this, you can uh, raise your hand and I'll call on you. Do you find that your age affects how you write during or that you've written during COVID, given your longer or shorter life experience perspective? The during COVID is the odd part of that question, because I do find as I get older, I write differently because <laughs> I, I, I forget who said this originally, but, you know, when you, you when he was young, he said he knew everything. And then he, as he got older, he knew less and less. That's how I feel, you know. I used to be much surer of how the world worked. I'm still sure of how it should work. But I used to be much surer of how it did work. 
-hmm. And I'm less and less sure of that now. And so I think my writing reflects that. Uh, I don't know that COVID affected that at all. Anyone else? I think when I was a younger person, younger writer, that I had, a, a, as a person, a lot of optimism that I don't have now. Mm. And I don't know if that's age or context, but it does affect, I think my books have become uh, darker, less less buoyant, because it's hard for me to, to feel that, that good change is as achievable. Anyone else? Well, with my story, the man in it is older. And so that, I mean, it's more, it's more easily to, uh, relatable to me as I've gotten older to see that perspective and sure. uh, sympathize with it to some degree. So, yeah. Well, I, I became a golden girl this year. So I do, I, I mean, I have to admit, I do think like, okay, I'm going to have X amount of year. Who knows, right? Who knows? But in the back of my mind is, is there any store? It's kind of like a bucket list. I don't know what a Hold golden a girl is. Well, 6-0. 6-0, oh. <laughs> oh, Sarah. I'm going to be 75 tomorrow. So oh. Happy early birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday, yeah. Happy birthday, yeah. So I have a lot to learn. But I, I think I, I'm such a planner, which is bad in some ways in terms of my life. So I do consider, is there a bucket list? Is there a story that I feel like I have to write, you know, mm -hmm. before what? wh whatever I <laughs> before whatever. We did get a little clarification from Gail who asked the question. Um, side note, hi Gail, thanks for calling the store today and saying hi. Good to see you on here tonight too. Um, she said in terms of their outlook for the future as we move through this period and that you guys are interpreting the question as you meant it. So as she meant it. So there you go. Good job. Um, I would like to take this moment before we wrap up. I want to go one by one and um, ask you either what your latest release was, what of your own, that's not an anthology related um, topic, what you want to talk about really quickly, a book that you have coming up or one that just came out. Um, so why don't we start with you, SJ? Well, my latest was um, Family Business, yeah, which uh, came out in uh, December. And uh, I'm, I'm working on a couple of other things now, but um, that that is... The, the most recent um, in the Bill Smith, Lydia Chin series that actually was in the Lydia Chin, Bill Smith series was yeah. the narrator of, of that one. And uh, that, that uh, you know, everything else is down the road, so. Perfect. Naomi, you already said um, sequel to Clark and Division coming out. Yeah, already. and then the, I'm, I love Soho's production of this paperback for Clark and Division. It's, I just dropped a link in the comments when you mentioned it, it before. So it's so beautiful. And it has a lot of bonus material in the back. And then for a lighter story, although a story told during the pandemic is one David mentioned is my Kauai series um, and internal lay. Excellent. Um, Sarah? I just published Overboard three weeks ago, which is a book in the V.I. Warshawski series. And um, I don't know. It has it. It has typical elements of corruption and and people with a lot of money and power doing very wicked things, and um, and Vi helping two runaway teenagers find themselves and, and get sorted out with family difficulties. But my editor said that for this book, the real heroes were the dogs. So VI's dogs play a, a major role in both mending lives and in actually setting the book in motion. Oh, good. And we have had several comments uh, already, people who are reading or have just finished Overboard and love it, as with oh, all of your so yeah, Warshawski books. So um, there's much talk of it in the comments. All right, and David, how about you? I have just a couple of short stories in the pipeline, waiting for a nay or yay on those. And I finished a novel um, called Star Rock, which, which I mentioned to Naomi uh, 
uh, it's a different situation. It's another private investigator book. I haven't gotten it to anybody else, but I just finished it. Well, good. Great. Well, um, perhaps we can bother SJ to hold up the book one more time. <laughs> we can see the beautiful masterpiece that is the latest MWA anthology, Crime Hits Home, available at the link in the comments. Um, thank you all for joining me tonight. Um, it's, thank you for having us. Of yes, course. Thank you. A, a and I wish that we could be there in person, but it was great. Yeah. Here, yeah. Really. Great course. to see everyone on yeah. the screen. Yes. Yeah, nice to see everybody. All right. Well, I think I'm going to sign us off for the evening. We've done our jobs. We've talked about the book. It's been delightful. Everyone have a wonderful night. And thanks again for being here. And thanks to those of you who are watching. Bye. Thanks, thanks McKenna. Everybody. Bye. Bye.